Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that, that, uh, that warm introduction and for the invitation to be here. You know, as a kid, I always wanted to play in a place like this, but I guess this is the second best thing, to be able to speak in a place like this. Let me start by thanking the NRA, by thanking all of you and all of the Second Amendment defenders across America for the work that you're doing to protect individuals and families across this great country by protecting their Second Amendment rights. Your work is a key part of our effort to save the American dream in the 21st century. You know, the American dream is often misunderstood. Some mistake it for being about how much money you make or how many things you end up owning. And while financial prosperity is part of the American dream, that dream is about things much simpler and yet much more profound. At its core, the American dream is about having the opportunity to achieve happiness. The happiness that comes from being free to worship as you choose. The happiness that comes from being able to find and keep meaningful and rewarding work. It's about passing your values and your traditions onto your children. It's about giving them the opportunity at a life even happier than your own. This is the real American dream. And it is a dream that is only possible if first and foremost, you can start and raise a family in a home that is stable, safe, and secure. But today, there are far too many voices in our politics that view the Second Amendment right of each individual to own and bear arms as a relic of the past. They see it as a guarantee that has outlived its usefulness and its purpose. Why do we need guns to secure our families, they ask. That's what government can do for us now. What they fail to realize is that the safety of our families is not something that people should be forced to hope government can provide. Rather, it is a, funda rather, it is a fundamental right that every American deserves to have. And passing, and passing along a family tradition of hunting and shooting is not something that we should have to ask our leaders for permission to do. It is, a, it is fundamental to achieving happiness in America. And for these reasons, I have always believed that the Second Amendment is about so much more than just the right to bear arms. At its core, it is about preserving our God-given right to life, to liberty, and to pursue happiness. That was for MSNBC, I did that. We gather here with the eyes of the nation upon us because today our nation is engaged in an active debate about the scope and the meaning of the Second Amendment. At every turn, politicians and some in the media and in entertainment are carrying out nothing less than an orchestrated attempt, not simply to erode our right to bear arms, but to stigmatize gun owners and gun ownership. Today, we live under many Second, Amer Second Amendment restrictions. And yet, the slippery slope continues with an administration and a gun control lobby obsessed with getting even more. The futility and the ineffectiveness of gun restrictions is evidenced by the simple fact that many of our cities with the most gun crimes happen to be the ones with the strictest gun laws. And the reason for this is clear. Law-abiding gun owners, like those here today, like myself, we will inevitably, even if grudgingly, follow the law. But the criminals do not. Criminals ignore and break the law because, by definition, that is what criminals do. Now, in the past, we could find some solace in the notion that so long as the Second Amendment was in place, even the most radical anti-gun leaders would be restrained. 
But now we have a president who believes that he has the power to remake firearm policy in this country by executive order, using his pen and his phone. It's worse. We have an attorney general who believes that we should be forcing gun owners to wear bracelets in order to operate their firearms. So, so what can we do about this? What can we do about this? Well, here's the first thing. Take comfort, take comfort, because in just 32 months, we will have a new president. And our current president should take comfort because in 32 months, he can return home to live in the anti-gun utopia that is Chicago. Well, but, waiting, but waiting for better leaders is not enough. We must counter the misinformation and the stigmatization of guns and gun owners by continuing to engage every American with the truth. The truth that the Second Amendment isn't just a bunch of words on a paper. It's exercised as a way of life in communities across America, and it has been for decades. The truth that sometimes responsibly exercising one Second Amendment right can be the difference between life and death. And the truth that many of these leading voices who want to take away your right to protect your families, they themselves are well protected by men and women with the kind of guns they do not want you to have. This, this campaign of truth will not be easy. For those in entertainment and in the media will continue to perpetuate stereotypical myths about those who feel passionately about gun rights. They like to paint us as paranoid, bitter people, in the President's words, clinging to God and a Constitution that they believe is outdated, at least when it comes to the Second Amendment. They attack this very organization, the National Rifle Association, as the problem, never mind the fact that its members are among the most law-abiding individuals anywhere in this country. But the best way to counter these lies will always be the stories of real Americans who share our commitment to our right to bear arms. Recently, a young lady who works in my office shared with us such a story. She grew up in Miami in a family of hunters. She went away to college in Washington, D.C., which, as all of you know, has long prided itself on having some of the nation's strictest gun laws. Yet an above average crime rate. She didn't bring any firearms with her to college, but when she celebrated her 21st birthday, she didn't ask for an open bar tab. Instead, she asked for her own firearm. And so like myself, she went through the training and the process to receive her concealed weapons permit in the state of Florida. Once she graduated from college, she joined our office and decided to make D.C. her home for work, and she decided it was time to bring her firearms with her. So she began the process of registering her Ruger 22 and the 38 Special. Soon, she discovered that firearms need to be registered with the D.C. police. You must call and personally tell them of your intent to register the firearm before you even bring it into the district. Once you've communicated that intent, you have 48 hours to file an application for registration. And it has to be done in person. It has to be done at police headquarters, an office that's only open from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. And each firearm requires a different registration. So after going through this process to conceal and carry in Florida, it cost her another $61 and half a day of work to legally register two firearms she owned in the District of Columbia. Now, you're probably thinking the same thing I did when I heard this story. What criminal 
would ever subject themselves to this process. Here you have all these gun laws and hoops to jump through, supposedly in the name of protecting people from gun violence. And yet the very people they are designed to protect us from are the last ones who will ever go through it. And what this young woman's story reminds us is of all the honest, law-abiding, patriotic Americans that are just trying to achieve their American dream for themselves and for their families. They may not agree with all these laws, but rest assured, they will follow them. But the evil people who would do them harm will not follow them. Look, we're all outraged and heartbroken at recent incidents in which so many innocent people have lost their lives. We wept and mourned, just like the rest of the country, at these senseless acts of violence. But public policy must always be guided by common sense, by embracing what works and rejecting what does not, making it harder for law-abiding Americans to defend themselves has not, does not, and will not prevent future tragedies such as these. And meanwhile, meanwhile, these anti-gun zealots use these tragedies to further their agenda, we neglect to pursue the things that would actually make our people safer. Keeping off the streets criminals who use firearms, that would work. Addressing the serious mental health issues in this country, that would work. But making it harder for you and for me and for this young lady who works for me to own a gun, that would be a waste of time. In fact, that would be unconstitutional. In closing, in closing, let me just say that over the next few days, what has transpired here will be abundantly covered by media outlets from coast to coast. And I assure you there will be no shortage of misrepresentations. But while, but while who we are and what we stand for will continue to be distorted, we must continue to move ahead. Because this right we gather here to defend is so important to who we are as a nation. You know, I'm always amused at those who come up to me and say, no other country has a constitutional right like this, as if to imply that there is something wrong with us. But we say, no other country has a constitutional right like this, not with scorn, but with pride. Because yes, America is different. It is unique from any other nation on earth. That is why almost six decades ago, a young couple boarded an airplane in Havana and came here because it was the only place on earth where poor and powerless people like them had a chance to get ahead. That young couple were my parents, and I often thank God that they did come here, to this place like no other. And that is what we should always want our country to be. We do not want America to just be another country. We want an America that is different and better than any other place on earth. In America, in America where people have a right to speak freely, to worship openly, and to own a gun. That, that is the America we inherited from those who came before us. And that is the America that we are now called to leave behind for the next generation the single greatest nation that man has ever known. God bless all of you, and may God always bless our country. Thank you.